in your son's wonderful name. Amen. Well, you may be seated. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm from uh, Brisbane. Um, oh, I've got a few yays. All right, all right. That's nice. Um, and it's great to just be down here and be with you. Uh, our church is currently doing exactly what we just did. We're singing songs. We're, we're praising Jesus. Uh, someone's about to step into a pulpit and preach and make much of Jesus. Uh, and we're seeking to reach people in Brisbane, just like you are in Adelaide and Adelaide East. And so essentially, we're just one big family. And I say that so that you just treat me as family and therefore give me a whole lot of grace today. Um, because we, we don't know each other. I don't, I don't know your stories. I don't know uh, your journey. Uh, maybe you're in the room and you're not a Christian. Uh, I don't know that. Maybe you're in the room and you're a hurting Christian. And you're a wounded Christian. Or maybe you're someone who's been a Christian for a long time. And for some reason, God is calling you to, to leave this church and to go back uh, to another church. And so we're, we're, we're all here. We're different people on a different journey. And I don't know your journey. But I do know Jesus. And I would love to talk about him and the church. And uh, so today, my hope is really just to encourage you about the future of your church. And this church, City Light East. And to maybe give you a few things that might help you in your journey along the way, not as an expert, but as someone who is in the same trenches with you, seeking to plant churches, to reach people for Jesus, make much of Jesus in our city. Uh, I love this, this line here, so that the world would know that Jesus has its greatest treasure. Um, and so we are going to be in the book of Colossians. I'm going to be moving around. Uh, a fair bit today. So if you have a Bible, which is on your seat, uh, page 924, uh, if you want to be there, um, I'm going to be moving pretty, pretty quickly through it. So um, you can either just listen, or if you want to just kind of go back and forth, I'll, I'll kind of give the references uh, to that. But essentially, uh, uh, churches, churches are a wonderful thing. And they, they have uh, a lifespan, a life journey, if you want to say, a life cycle. And essentially, um, what, what this church is, is you are a church plant. Uh, you planted in 2021 um, because you're crazy and decide, like, pandemics, who cares? Let's just do this thing. Uh, most of us waited, and, or we did it before or we waited. Uh, God called you to plant in the middle of a pandemic. Praise God. Nothing stops God and His work. And so um, we have been a church plant uh, like you. And then a church sort of moves somewhere along the way from being a church plant to sort of becoming a an established church. You found your grounding in the city, you kind of know what you're doing, and then eventually we, we move to becoming like a resourcing church, another church that when they then send out and have another church plant. And so a part of Acts 29, our, our sort of uh, ethos is as we read through the scriptures, particularly the book of Acts, we just keep seeing that churches go and plant and then eventually they're established and leaders are built up and eventually they plant again uh, because I don't know if you know, but more, more people need Jesus and therefore we need more churches. Um, and so uh, in that sort of journey, uh, there's a whole lot of things that are really, really important to be aware of and to think through and to consider. Um, and so as a family, we do this thing called our up, down, and across. So at our dinner table, I've got four children. Uh, one's 14, boy, girl who's 12, going on 19, uh, 10, and then a seven-year-old. And so um, family devotions has kind of taken, it's like it's different morphings. And, and so what we've found that really, really works is like individual, individual devotions in the bedroom. But around the table, we do our up, down, and across. And our up is, where have you seen God's grace today? And how can we celebrate that? Down is, uh, where would you like to ask for more of God's grace today? It's, it's kind of like, what was hard today? What was difficult? And then across is like, where have you given God's grace today or received God's grace today? So essentially, we're going to do something similar. So we're going to actually start with, we're going to go down, we're going to go up, we're going to go across, and then we're going to go out. And the down is not the bad thing, Okay. So what I want to sort of walk through is think through these sort of directions. Down, up, across, and then out. Are you with me? And we're going to move through different, different metaphors. And so I want to start with thinking down. 
Now, when you plant, when you start a church, you've started thinking the down part, the foundations. What are we going to build this church on? And every church does this. And really, in the first few years, you're really, what you're doing is you're laying the foundation of like, what is this church going to be built upon so that then we can grow up? And so I don't want to start with the up. I want to start with the down because the temptation of any church is that as you start to grow up, you forget the foundation. You forget upon which we have been built. And all of a sudden we start becoming almost like we're doing all of these good things. And and we're going to come up with, you guys are going to come up with heaps of great ideas. And some of them should be done. Maybe some of them shouldn't be done. But there is something that we cannot lose, and that's the foundation. So you have to keep coming back to it over and over and over and over again. And so it's like building your first home. When when my wife and I first bought our first house, uh, we didn't think about having two bathrooms. Um, Because there was two of us, now there's six of us, and we have three daughters. So we need seven bathrooms. Okay, um, as, as we've grown, we've realized there are things that need to shift in, in terms of like we need more rooms, we need different things. But we always come back to us as a family of going, but what's really important? Whether we have two bathrooms, whether we have three bathrooms, or whether we have a family in the home. And so we constantly have this wrestle of like, this is, this is just, it's just a house and we could sell it. What matters is who's in the house. And how this family runs, that's what's important. Whether we have five bedrooms or two, that's least important. It's important. It matters. It makes a difference. It it helps with less fighting. But what is the foundation? What is most important? So Paul opens up this letter in Colossians chapter 1. And he says, Paul, verse 1, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers of Christ at Colossae, grace and And peace to you. He does this often in in his letters. But verse 3 says, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints. Now listen to verse 5. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before. In the world of truth, the gospel, which has come to you. As indeed in the whole world, it's bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood it, uh, understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. Did you notice all the past tense? So he's writing to a church who was planted and is now becoming established, and he's reminding them, this, don't lose this. Don't, don't forget that the whole point of this is Jesus. This is the gospel that you have heard, which has come since the day you heard it and understood it. And so you see this in Paul's letters all the time. He's writing to all these churches and he's reminding them of like, the music's great. The coffee, it's great. The drumming, okay, you know, it depends, it depends on the drummer on the day, right? Um, um, all, all, all those things, things are good. Those things are important. We cannot lose the gospel of Jesus Christ. We cannot get past it. We cannot forget it. We can't let it become just the thing that we hear over and over and over again. It's like, oh yeah, we, we know the gospel. Jesus died. He's buried. He raised again. That's, that's awesome. Now let's get on to the real work. Jesus is the work. Like he is what this is all about. He is what this whole church is to be built upon. And as you go forth and do great things and good things for God, keep coming back to Jesus. The, the way that Paul speaks about the gospel in different books, he kind of he kind of takes different different angles and different aspects. It's like this diamond. He's kind of you know he's kind of looking at all these different dimensions and ways to look at it. One of the ways he speaks about it in Colossians is that we were taken from darkness into the glorious light. I've seen people be Christians who that's no longer something that stirs their heart and are grateful for because they've been Christians for so long now. It's like, no, 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 no. 
Jesus took us from darkness to light and we can never get tired of hearing that. And so City Light East, maybe you're new here. This is a church that is going to preach about Jesus and the gospel and it's going to preach from the Bible and you're just going to have to get over it because that's just what we do. And we're going to keep doing it. And some people in our church have said, it's like you preach the same sermon every week. I know. Because <laughs> really there, there's, 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 one, there's one story here. And we just keep coming back to it and back to it because that's the foundation upon which we are built. That is the foundation of our faith. The way that Paul speaks about it in, in 1 Corinthians, uh, in, in chapter 3, he says, According to the grace of God given to me like a skilled master builder, I laid, I laid a foundation... And someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. And then chapter 15, he says, Now I'd remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you. And he goes on to explain that it's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And, and every, every, every letter he's writing, he's writing to a church that's already been planted to remind them. Don't forget this. Don't get off track of this. You, you've got to keep checking the foundation as you grow up so that you don't get off the mission of making much of Jesus. The goal is not to make City Light East the best church and the greatest church and the biggest church the goal of City Light East is to point people so that they would come to know Christ as their greatest treasure. And you cannot stop doing that. Ever. And when you do, call each other back. Hey, 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 hey. You know our DG, our DG stuff? Like we're doing this good stuff? Let's keep making Jesus the center of that. Let's keep our conversation in our coffees. In our songs that we worship, like are they, are they making much of Jesus? We've got to ask these, these questions as we continue to go on and on and on and keep battling, keep fighting. So let me ask you this question, City Light East. Is your preaching pointing to Jesus and constantly doing that? Are the songs in which we sing continually pointing to Jesus? Are our discipleship times and our group times and our coffee times and our catch-up times pointing to Jesus? You as individual men and women, do you still love hearing that Jesus died for you and was buried and then rose again for you? How do you continually stir that up? Because that is the foundation of this church. That's the foundation of your faith. And as this church one day plants another church, that church must be about Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. So that's an encouragement for us to keep on track, and you're going to have to fight for it. So think down, but then also think up. When, when Paul speaks to this church, he starts speaking about their maturity as a church. He wants them to grow up. And so... Uh, the gospel, the good news of Jesus, what it does for us is it not only takes us from darkness to light, it often can take us from being wounded to being healed. From being children and, and immature to, to growing up into maturity. And so the gospel essentially, it, it saves us and it sanctifies us, it matures, it grows us. And so the church that you're in right now, in many ways, like you're young, you're a child. And you, you, in the beginning, you, you just, what does a baby do? It's just like, I just want to survive. I just need to live. And if you don't give me milk, like I'm going to cry and let you know, I need milk because I, I just need to survive. And that's normal. But what can happen in a church plant is you stay in survival. And we've just got to get church on. We've just got to get, just got to get this, got to get this. But the church also needs to go, no, we also need to grow up. We need to mature. We need to think about, okay, how are we doing certain things? And is that now helpful for our family? So our rhythms as a family with four children, so we had three under three and a half, and then we, we added a fourth, and then that meant, oh, like we can't fit in the car. <laughs> 
Now, people didn't warn us about this. Like, people like, you're kind of crazy for having four, but people didn't go, you're crazy because now you've got to get like a van or something. You're like, you need a bus because you've got to go from five seats to six seats. So it's costly. And, and how are you going to do this whole family thing? And, and we still don't know, so please help us. Uh, we're still working that out. Um, and, and in every church, there, again, there are degrees and there's a journey that we're all on. Some of us in this room have been Christians for 20 years. Some of us are, have been Christians for less than a year. And, and maybe some of us in the room, we're not, we're not Christians. And so what we need is we need, we need each other to help grow and mature and think and so what Paul does in verse 9, listen to the way he talks. Chapter 1, verse 9, he says, And so from the day we heard it, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Why? So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. Chapter 2, if you move there to verse 6 and 7, it says, Therefore, as you received Christ the Lord, so walk in him. Rooted and built up and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. 128 to 29, him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. And so what the heart of Paul for this church is not just that they would not leave their foundation, but they'd keep building upon it and growing. And so... For some of us who are new to faith, keep reading this, keep reading this book. It's like crazy good. You, you will meet people in this book and you're like, oh, that's, my, I, that's my story, that's my journey. That, wow, that's awesome. They're going to they're gonna help you see how they journeyed through things and, then, and kept walking and, and saw the faithfulness of God that will edify you and encourage you. Um, th- there's, there's books in here that you're like, Oh, yeah, I've got no idea what's going on in Zacharias, some weird dream stuff happening there, and some, whoa, whoa, yeah, okay. So let's just go back to James, because it tells me, like, just to watch how I speak, right? And there's a sense of, like, no, we need to read Zechariah. We need to read Hosea. We need to read some of these books, because God has so much to say through his word to us. And then the temptation, if you're a young Christian, is to go, I don't understand it. And what I tell our church is, like, just read it. And if you just keep reading it and you do that for the next 20 years, in 20 years you're like, let me tell you about Zechariah and how this whole thing works. And I can, I can, because it's, it's this story and you're like, you're like a child who's learning to read, but over time you're like, I can read. And I, and I, and I get what's happening there and how it's pointing to Jesus. And, and it's wonderful. Do you know, I, I, got, I got saved by reading this book. I was a non Christian, convinced that God exists. And my parents were Christians, and so there was no way I was going to engage with whatever their thing was. And so I started reading the Quran and the Hadith. And I started exploring Buddhism and Hinduism. And what I found was, is everywhere you go, Jesus is in every religion somehow. It's like, man, God's smart. And then I was like, oh, I have to read the book about him. Oh, and I picked up this book. And I, just, I read it from Genesis, and I just read it all the way to Jesus. And actually, I eventually got to Ephesians, and that's where God was like, just light went on. And I was like, that's my God. And I learned who God was by reading a book. I had no idea how anything fit together. Like, I'm reading Leviticus, going... <laughs> Oh, what the heck is this? And some of, you, some of you do your Bible reading plan, you're like, yes, Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and you, know, and you skip the thing and you're like, but, but he, he's in here, he's all over here, and, and, and we want to keep, keep reading and learning and growing and maturing in our spiritual maturity. And here's the thing, if you do that, one day someone who's not a Christian is going to walk in this door and God's going to save them. And they're going to want to quit 
and not read the book because they're like, I don't understand it. And you're going to be like, I know. It's a journey. So just sit with me and I'll read with you. And we'll read it together. And we'll read it together. And that person's going to do it again. And that person's going to do it again. And this is how disciples make disciples that make disciples that make disciples. So that when we're no longer here in City Light East, there's a whole lot of people who aren't even born yet that are teaching people how, how to grow in their faith and mature in Jesus Christ. Amen? This is, this is how it works. Um, he speaks about maturity in Colossians 1.22. He says, He is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. There is a sense in which as we mature as a church, we start not wanting to do things that we used to want to do. God, God starts to work the light into us in such a way that we actually become more like Jesus. When we planted our church, we were so excited. Like we had this plan. We had this plan and it was way better than your plan. Like trust me, it was, it was so good. Like we knew exactly what we're doing. We had no idea. Um, and and we, we kind of planted out a crisis and I won't go into the whole story, but we planted and six weeks in, a core couple were in sexual adultery with, with another core couple that we never knew. And like we just started this thing and all of a sudden we got to like two whole families that have been decimated by sin. We cannot take this stuff lightly, church. Your walk with the Lord, your individual walk with the Lord, your own holiness, your own righteousness matters to God and he wants to grow us up. At the same time, we've seen the opposite in our church. So there's a couple right now in our church who lead, we, we call them life groups. And when they, when they joined our church, they were part of our, our core plant, and they were some of the most fearful people because of some of their past. And so they lived in this street, and they'd lived in this street for about 15 years, and they'd never had a single neighbor ever enter into their home. And so as we're talking about how we want to do life, we want to like use our homes and our tables as places to welcome people. They're like, I love the Jesus taking me from darkness to light thing. I hate this thing. What, like this meal thing, this come into my house thing, it's like not happening. Uh, so let's praise the name, but not eat together. You know, and it was like this crazy thing. And, and so we just started talking to them and talking to them and talking to them. And now they lead a life group in which they have asked for it to be every single week. And we, we try to have, like, we close at December, and, like, we never close. Like, our life group just keeps going. And then once a month, they give up their Sunday afternoons as a family to have somebody brand new who they don't know from our church in their home. Six years ago, not a single person, they didn't know a single neighbor's name. Not one. They didn't want to know their names. Now, every time we go to their children's birthday parties, two neighbours come to every single one of their kids' parties. Why? Because God has matured them and grown them in their faith. And they have been this on this journey. And so right now, you might be in a similar spot to them where you're seeing what, what God's calling you to and you're like, uh-uh. It's like, that's okay. Keep reading the book. Keep coming to church, keep doing the thing because in two years, three years, four years, five years, you will be in a different place. And then you're going to be able to help the next person who comes in who's just like what you were. And you'll be able to say, I know what it's like to be like that. I know what it's like to struggle with that. And God has transformed me. God can transform you. Come on the journey. And so the church starts to grow up into spiritual maturity. The church also has to grow up in organizational maturity. That's a sense in which, at the moment, there's things that you don't yet do that you will need to do in the future because you're not going to have just the same amount of people. There's things that will shift, things that will change. And that's a good thing because you're maturing and you're growing as a church. But what this means is, is it means you need to be able to have the spiritual maturity to discern between biblical commands and personal preferences. And so often in church plants, what happens is, is we, we love what's going on right now. And in three years from now, it's going to be very different. And some of you are going to go, 
I loved it when it was just us in the, is it the Hungarian hall? It was Russian. The, the old Russian Hungarian hall. And like now we're in this thing and like, like we don't have the weird like colors and like with the weird pictures and stuff and, you know, and, and, and things will be different. And you know what? That's normal. Our church has met in four locations in six years. And we still don't have air cons. So I've been just dealing with repenting of my envy this morning of like, oh, it's so cool in here. It's so beautiful in here. And here's the thing. Every time we move location, it totally changes the feel of our church. And so currently we're in a hall that can fit about 450 people. And we're a church of less than 200. The hall before that, we could fit 90 people in max. And so, like, we were so close and so neat and tight. And so it feels differently. And so we've had to just change some things. And that affects some people. And some people, they can't handle the shift because a personal preference has been put into the category of biblical conviction. And it's like, no, this is just, it just feels different because the room's different. And so I want to encourage you. You're not going to stay in this hall forever. You're not going to stay like this forever. Things will change. Don't conflate personal preference with biblical truth. And so if this church stops preaching Jesus, yeah, find a church that preaches Jesus. Okay. But if this church slightly changes the style of music, and Geordie says, like, we're not doing the Nord from the Lord thing anymore. Uh, we're doing the, the guitar thing. And, and things are different. Like, or the way that your group's structure, or the way... The way the kids men works, like there's going to be things that will change. And, and the team are just trying to do what they can to help this church mature and grow. So come along for the journey. Bring your input. Three, think across. Oh, if you read this book, man, he is so into how these people love each other. And it's awesome. He started, if you remember in, in chapter one, verse three, we always thank God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus... And the love that you have for all the saints. Chapter 2, 1 to 2. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you. And for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face. That their hearts may be encouraged. Being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance and understanding. Excuse me of the knowledge of God's mystery. I mean we heard a, a pre-sermon. <laughs> around like the difficulty it is here to leave. And the reason why it's hard for them to leave, for me, I don't even know the story, is clearly because they love you and you love them. And saying goodbye to a brother and sister in, in those things is because there has been depth of relationship and friendship and mutuality and coming alongside each other and edifying each other. And so God is... God is calling each church to grow in love, to grow in depth of relationship. And that is a beautiful thing because our culture does not know how to do this. Because our culture, you, you're either left or you're right, and we don't mix. We don't do that. You're either pro-vaccines and, and pro-masks, and, or you're anti. And how can you have a church that has... Two different things in, in, the same, in the same. So the church over COVID has, has had a wonderful opportunity to go, we've got people with different opinions and different viewpoints, and they're fine. Foundation is Jesus and his love for us, and therefore our foundation is our love for each other. So even though we have differences of opinion, that's secondary for us. We love each other. We, we, we've got people that live and earn this amount of money, and we've got people who who live and earn this amount of money. We've got people from this cultural background. We've got people from this age group. And the church is this thing that the world cannot understand. How can you all be together? Why don't you just hang out with your BFFs? Like, haven't you got your little group, your little club? And it's like, Jesus is my group and Jesus is my club and these are his people. And so that's my group. And we're all different. And you know what? It's one of the best witnesses to the world because they don't get it. They don't understand it, but they see it. And so, so Paul says, we've got to continue to grow in this thing called love. 
Verse 18, he says, Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason uh, by a sensuous mind and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grow with a growth that is from God. What What do ligaments and joints do? Like this is, again, the pre-sermon into the sermon where, where this body, where this thing where, where we don't just have one piece there, one piece there, like we're a whole body. And so we're participating together. We're finding ways in which we can contribute to the work of Jesus through his local church. And when the part of a body is not functioning properly, like we describe that, we define that as being that person's sick or that person's unhealthy. Right now, like I know you thought this was just a cool piece of uh, clothing and you're like, man, I really love the whole look going on in Brisbane. Um, like this is middle age hit me right here. You know, there, there's a part of my body which is not right. It's unhealthy and I've got to go see a doctor and get it healthy because this part of the body matters. Because after a while it starts to hurt me, it starts to affect me. And then I start to get grumpy at home because now I'm hurting and it, it has a whole different effect on, on my, my thing, right? And so every single person here who's a member of this church, you are a part of the body and you matter. Your health matters. Your spiritual vitality matters. Your walk with Jesus matters. Your walk with each other matters, but you matter. Your contribution matters. The part that you play is not insignificant. This, this what I'm doing right here, it's not like that this is the, the, the thing that matters and everything else doesn't matter. Everything matters to the Lord. We all have different roles. We play different things. We have different parts to play. So I want to encourage you. What role do you currently play in the life of this church? What is the part that you play? Because it's really easy, particularly as a church starts to grow, to kind of go, oh, there's enough people now, it's fine. When there was like just 30 and we're planning in in 2021, it's like, oh man, you can see all the needs. As the church grows, it's actually harder. And so what we have found is we have percentage-wise less people active in our church serving now that we're six years on than when we first planted. Because when we first planted, we planted with 30. And it was like, dude, that's your lead, that's your lead, that's your chair, that's your thing. Everyone had a role. And now that we're like a couple hundred people in, it's like people can just walk in and walk out and just be consumers. And you know what? We miss out. Because they have a personality. They have a story. They have something. And so Paul is like, this thing is this relational commitment to not just unity, but also to bearing with one another. He goes on to say, we forgive one another. We serve one another. And it's this beautiful picture of the church. And so the temptation for you as you continue to grow up is to, is to think that you're not needed anymore. No, you are. And we don't just want to send beautiful people away to create the need. (laughs) Now, stop the goal. Um, There's going to be needs. There's going to be people here that walk through this door that Carl cannot get to and cannot minister to like you can. He can't. And God will orchestrate you and your story and your journey to be the very thing they need to hear. What is your role? How can you play? And start to just ask God, God, what do you want me to do? And maybe, maybe you're more like my wife. My wife's like high-end introvert. She loves my personality type. (laughs) Um, She sees everybody that nobody's talking to. I don't, because I'm talking to you. And I don't see that person. For a while, because I'm engaged here already, I've already spoken to you. And so she sees who wasn't there that Sunday, and she picks up on that stuff. What's your role? What what part can you play as a ligament, an arm, a hand, an eye? And then lastly, we've got to be thinking out. The temptation of every church is what we call mission drift, and this is the idea. That disciples make disciples that make disciples. And churches plant churches that plant churches. And so at some point, this church, it should be in your heart to go, there's more people to be reached for Jesus. 
we're going to have to say goodbye to some people because we're sending them off to go and do a brand new thing so that more people can meet Jesus and treasure him. And you know what? It sounds awesome. It's really hard. We planted three years in. Gave away our best people. Gave away kids workers, best preachers, some of the, like, just the, the people who just everybody loves. And you're like, oh, I need you. Uh, our church, at that point, we we're, were about 100 people. We, were, we raised $70,000 from our church. It cost us money. And people were like, we were saving up for this holiday. We're doing this thing. But you know what? We need to have a church that gets planted in Calandra that preaches the Bible, that makes much of Jesus in that city. And so we are going to take steps to make sure that that happens. We were 100 people. We were small. We were little. We didn't know what we're doing. We still don't know what we're doing. But we have this sense which says we must be about the mission of Jesus and whatever God tells us to do, we're just going to go do it. And so he says this in chapter 4. He says, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us. Why? That God may open to us a door for the word. To declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So Paul's talking about his own life so he would be a model to their life so that they would start asking, where are the opportunities to make much of Jesus and preach the word? How can we be considerate of who we are talking to, how we're talking to them as men and women who believe the gospel of Jesus Christ? And so he's saying, pray for us that God would open more doors. <laughs> When we told our church we were planting, they're like, we haven't even started. We just got here and we're like in between venues and now we're going to send out like, what are we going to do? And I'm like, I don't know. Jesus knows. And you know what? We planted a church and that church is thinking about their next plant and when are they going to plant? We've baptized people that have never met Jesus before and have come to faith in our churches. We've had people who have walked in off the street, have come and heard the message of Jesus and have moved from darkness to light. And who knows, maybe one day they will go and plant a church. City Light, there are people in this city who don't need Jesus. You are needed. But we need more of you, more churches. And so even in your early stage of being young and thinking about, okay, how are we doing this? What is this looking like? It's got to still be in your heart of like, but we may need to, to go and plant one day. And so let's be thinking, let's be praying. And wherever God says to go, we go. And we trust him with the mission. And so our cities do not have enough Christians. Our cities do not have enough churches, let alone Bible preaching, Jesus pointing churches. And so I wonder today, what God might be calling you to do. And maybe it's just in your workplace. Maybe it's not to go and plant, but maybe it's to get up out of your cubicle and out of your desk or out of your classroom or out of your whatever it is that you're in and actually walk across and actually say, hey, do you want to go get coffee sometime? I'd like to build a friendship. Or, hey, would you like to come over? I'd like to come over to our house and we'd just have a meal or go and have a barbecue. Like it could be just something that small. Let me finish with just something that our family is doing, and it's actually my seven-year-old daughter. So we live next door to a family. We have two acres, and we lived there for about a year, and then they kind of moved into this other house, and they have a daughter exactly the same age as our daughter. And we had this early conversation around, we're Christians, I'm kind of a pastor, and it was clear, don't want to bury you. Don't talk to us. And they have like a Catholicism background. 
And we're like, oh man, we're going to pray, we're going to pray. And it was my seven-year-old daughter, who was five at the time, just kept going and calling Eden over and saying, hey, do you want to play? 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 All of a sudden, trust started getting built. And now Eden eats at our table once a week, every week. And she does our up, out, down, and across. She joins in and she's talking about, oh, this went well today. This didn't go well today. And someone helped me today. Maddie has now started, uh, sorry, Kelly has now started asking if, if Keller can come to church every week. And so now my wife brings Keller and Eden and they have fun in the car and, and Eden comes and stands in the front with us and now she's singing songs about Jesus. And guess what? Her mum came to church recently. <coughs> Sat in the front row. I was talking about giving that week. Oh, oh. That's when I was like, I don't know if I believe in sovereignty of God anymore. Like this just... <laughs> This is just dumb. Like, why would you have done this? Um, and you know what? Just come twice. And husband doesn't want to come. And we're just going to keep doing. Eden's going to keep coming and eating with us. They, you know, maybe your children are some of the best missionaries we got. And there are ways in which God is going to work. And we are praying for this family. And I, I'm convinced that God is just doing what he's doing. And he's bringing it. It's not in my timing. I wish Jarrah was there all the time, you know. But I, I'm praying, God, would you give me the privilege to baptize this family one day? Can you imagine that? Them sitting at my table and being moved from darkness to light. This is what we've got to be about. And so we can't even be about what we're doing today, which is like wonderful and beautiful. Because this is not just about us. There are so many people who need to meet Jesus. And you play a role in that. Amen.